And I'm going to talk about a text that actually doesn't mention Nero once. Not once. So, Seneca's letters and how not to write about the Emperor Nero. Seneca, as we've heard, had been one of Nero's closest associates since the year 49 when he was recalled from exile on the initiative, it seems, of Nero's mother Agrippina and appointed to serve as tutor to the 11-year-old Nero. After Nero's accession at the age of 16, Seneca continued for many years as one of his most influential advisors, at least on Tacitus' view. Nero is the addressee of Seneca's treatise on clemency, composed shortly after the, uh, Nero came to power. Credited with many of the more positive features of Nero's early years as emperor, Seneca was also implicated in more questionable developments, allegedly composing Nero's self-exculpatory letter to the Senate, for instance, after the murder of his mother. Seneca himself asked for permission to step down in 62. Nero refused, as Dominic reminded us, um, uh, though uh, Seneca contrived to keep a very low profile, subsequently petitioning the emperor for official permission to withdraw a second time in 64. The Epistulae Morales, the text I'm going to be talking about this afternoon, um, the moral letters, were composed in these last years of Seneca's life before he received the order from Nero in 65 to kill himself. Despite a profusion of apparently personal anecdote, the letters are, in a notable respect, curiously reticent. Much of Seneca's life was spent in Rome, but the, capital, the empire's capital itself is barely mentioned in the letters. Letter 91 explores what consolation may be offered to a friend whose hometown, Lyon, has been devastated by fire. This fire apparently struck in the late summer of 64 thus post-dating the terrible fire of Rome, whose ravages are described earlier in Tacitus' annals. Yet though the Rome fire was reported by Tacitus to have reduced a large part of the city to smouldering ruin, and we've been seeing um, earlier how Nero made use of the, the space thereby opened up, Seneca makes no mention of the Rome fire. And the emperor himself, with whom Seneca had been so closely associated for so many years, features as a resounding absence, not mentioned once in 124, often very lengthy, letters. Some comments can, of course, be read as oblique reflections on Seneca's relations with Nero. And there is a handout, sorry, which I've got back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, the wise man, the sapiens, will never provoke the anger of those in power, Seneca comments in letter 14. Yet those in power might flare up on the slenderest provocation. In the concluding sections of letter 47, largely focused on the issue of slavery, literal and metaphorical, the topic of relations between rulers and their subjects is touched on as an analogy for relations between masters and slaves. When masters are provoked to violence by trivial annoyances, they are like rulers who lash out, too ready to forget their own strength and the weakness of others. So we, as masters, take on the spirit of kings, Seneca observes. The tendency of some rulers to react violently when their subjects offer unwelcome advice could all too easily induce <coughs> subjects to behave like slaves, Tastus Annals regularly criticises the Senate for servile behaviour in relation to emperors. In Tastus' account of the circumstances of Nero's death, Seneca responds to Nero's messenger and the allegation that he, um, Seneca, had been involved in the Pisonian conspiracy with an assertion that Nero had more often experienced his Seneca's outspokenness than his civility. Quisipius libertatem Senecae quam servitium expertus est. Syntastus account. In Seneca's own writing, the term libertas, freedom, rarely has an overtly political sense. It is sometimes, however, used to express the kind of frank advice characterised in Greek texts as parasia, which the teacher gives the student for the latter's own good. In his treatise on anger, for instance, Seneca advises, let us all beg our best friends to use to the utmost such liberty towards us, especially when we are least able to bear it, and let there be no approval of our anger. So we want our friends to be frank with us. But the challenge for the philosophical advisor seeking to offer 
parousia, um, free speech to a ruler, or even to a social superior, was a concern of numerous imperial texts. How can one speak truthfully to the prince? Seneca's letter 73 explores a different aspect of the relations between rulers and philosophers. Seneca argues at some length that the philosopher, above all, is grateful to the ruler. Um, the term rex here is a positive term, as in Seneca's earlier treatise on clemency, who, by ensuring that the state is secure and peaceful, makes possible a life of philosophical leisure. That securitas we saw paraded earlier. It's quite wrong, Seneca asserts, to think of philosophers as stubborn and rebellious. Here, he seems to be distancing himself from any association between Stoic philosophy and opposition to the emperor. Might a contrast be implied between Seneca and others who'd been openly critical of Nero? The term libertas, freedom, seems to have been invoked as a watchword by the senator Thrasia Paetus, who was notorious for criticising Nero. At the same time, Seneca's comments would scarcely qualify as unmitigated servile praise. Just as a man honours and reveres his teachers, says Seneca, through whose help he has left behind earlier wanderings, so too he regards those under whose protection he is able to put his philosophy into practice. Now that first part of the comparison, as a man honours and reveres his teachers, might seem particularly ironic given uh, Nero's behaviour towards his teacher Seneca. Uh, increasingly errant rather than leaving errors behind. Um, so I think it's uh, tempting to see considerable irony here. The letters repeatedly advocate withdrawal from the political sphere. Seneca's addressee, Lucilius, is urged to give up his post as procurator, the better to devote himself to philosophy. In letter 68, Seneca warns Lucilius that it may be prudent to cloak philosophical withdrawal under the pretext of ill health. Valitudo in Bacillitas. He himself is said by Tacitus to have feigned illness or used the excuse of his illness, uh, quasi valitudine infensa, to request withdrawal, first of all in 62 um, and then again in 64. Seneca comments earlier in the letters Although people may often have thought that I withdrew because of being fed up with state business and regretting my unfortunate and thankless position, Still, in the retreat to which fear and exhaustion have thrust me, ambition sometimes is rekindled. Is this a tantalising glimpse of how Seneca really felt after all those years of working with Nero? It would, I think, be unwise to read any of Seneca's first-person comments as a straightforward reflection of his own experiences. This example, for instance, serves to illustrate the general claim that even in seclusion, the would-be philosopher is still prey to mental disturbances such as anxiety and ambition. And Miriam Griffin, um, uh, Miriam Griffin and others have rightly highlighted the challenge of pinning down traces of the autobiographical in a text whose author, despite the apparently confessional tone uh, he often adopts, uh, frequently proves slippery and evasive. This caution is in many ways well advised, and yet, for all their aspirations to a transcendent cosmopolitan perspective, the letters remain closely rooted, I would suggest, in the political, cultural, and aesthetic specificity of Neronian Rome. Seneca veers between intimate, confessional, hectoring, and expository modes. He offers personalized advice to his addressee Lucilius. He chastises himself for his own failings, while later letters discourse at length on technical, philosophical questions such as the nature of the good. Yet even in these later letters, lengthy passages are devoted to excoriating in indignant detail the moral failings of Seneca's contemporaries. These passages are often dismissed as kind of, I suppose, moral, moralizing padding. Um, certainly we shouldn't underestimate their function as entertainment, nor their connections with uh, earlier satiric traditions. Um, but when Seneca reflects on the dynamics of vice in its more florid and imaginative forms, his terms frequently resonate quite specifically with ancient accounts of Neronian Rome in particular, notably those of Tacitus and Suetonius that we've been hearing about, as well as other works of Neronian literature, Petronius and Perseus above all. By this point, Seneca could hardly have expected his advice to exert any positive effect on his former pupil, um, as we've heard Nero was a bit of a lost cause at this stage. 
That kind of freedom of speech is in the letters directed at Lucilius, or indeed at Seneca himself, or at other readers who chose to embrace the project of Stoic self-improvement. Uh, Seneca's Nero is really not included in that number. But in relation to Nero, an inescapable presence in Seneca's world, um, Seneca also makes clear his refusal to stoop to flattery. Rather, I shall suggest, discussing particularly letters 90 and 114, Nero serves, if in a rather oblique manner, as an exemplar of the lack of self-command, of the surrender to vice, of the extreme rejection of nature. Nature is an absolutely critical term in Stoic discourse for what one should um, be pursuing. An arrestingly potent manifestation of the pathology of an individual utterly lacking in sovereignty over himself, I suggest, is Nero. And I'll conclude by suggesting how, to a degree, highly refined vices could even play a particular role in Seneca's model of philosophy's development. Luxurious building looms large among the vices of his age castigated by Seneca, who condemns at length the coloured marbles and elaborate water features adorning the homes of his contemporaries. We've been having some uh, very suggestive glimpses of those earlier on in Professor LaRocca's paper. <coughs> Seneca frequently contrasts such lavish and complex constructions with the simpler structures of earlier times. Now, interestingly, the author of the pseudo Seneca Octavia that we've uh, um, Dominic was talking about earlier and has also come up again subsequently. Um, this is the only history play to survive from Roman antiquity and probably, as we've heard, was composed not long after Seneca's death. Um, but the author of this play obviously regarded these kind of sentiments as distinctively Senecan because the speeches that, get, that are given by Seneca in the play uh, harp on precisely these themes. The evils of luxurious architecture are, of course, a theme prominent in attacks on luxury more generally. We find uh, Cicero already criticizing elaborate ceilings, um, but such criticism was particularly pertinent in Nero's Rome. Suetonius comments on Nero, there was nothing in which he was more ruinously prodigal than in building. In the wake of the fire of 64, as we heard, Nero constructed for himself a new palace, the Golden House, um, the most conspicuous symptom of a new and more material golden age, um, which Professor LaRocca has uh, described so eloquently earlier on. Having noted the opulent decoration of the house, um, all parts were overlaid with gold and adorned with gems and mother of pearl, Suetonius attests the emperor's taste for ingenious and <coughs> lavish ceilings, in particular, Cenationes laqueatae, um, tabulis egones, versatilibus. There were dining rooms with fretted ceilings of ivory whose panels could turn and shower down flowers um, uh, and were fitted with pipes for sprinkling <coughs> the guests with perfumes. The main banquet hall was circular and constantly revolved day and night like the heavens. My interesting kind of um, uh, focus there on the, the kind of cosmic features of the dining room that I think resonates with what Professor LaRocca was drawing our attention to earlier on. Ceilings with moving panels are an architectural feature singled out for marked criticism in Seneca's Letter 90. In these our own times, which man, pray, do you deem the wiser? The one who invents a process for spraying saffron perfumes to a tremendous height from hidden pipes, who fills or empties canals by a sudden rush of waters, who so cleverly constructs a dining room with a ceiling of movable panels that it presents one pattern after another, the roof changing as often as the courses, that's you know, the extraordinary uh, archetype of ingenuity, or the one who proves to others, as well as to himself, that nature has laid upon us no stern and difficult law when she tells us we can live without the marble cutter and the engineer, that we can clothe ourselves without traffic in silk fabrics, that we have everything that is indispensable to our use, provided only that we are content with what the earth has placed on its surface. It's a very kind of rhetorical um, uh, contrast between the, the, the simple cynic life and the elaborate life of luxury. And later on in this very long letter, he again returns to the topic. No fretted, and, and this is, he's talking about the lives of early men who lived a, a sort of wonderfully simple um, life that we should all aspire to, to imitate. No fretted and panel ceilings hung, hung over them, but as they lay beneath the open sky, the stars glided quietly above them, and the firmament, night's noble pageant, marched swiftly by, conducting its mighty tasks in silence. 
but then by day as well as by night, the visions of this most glorious abode were free and open. It was their joy to watch the constellations as they sank from mid-heaven, and others again as they rose from their hidden abodes. What else but joy could it be to wander among the marvels which dotted the heavens far and wide? But you of the present day shudder at every sound your houses make, and as you sit among your frescoes, the slightest creak makes you shrink in terror. They had no houses as big as cities. And it's hard to resist the temptation here to, to bring in the joke that Suetonius tells us was, was made about the, the golden house. That's to say, Rome is becoming one house. So that's the, 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 the comment on, precisely on the nearest Domus Ara. And we can see a resonance there with um, the comment that an early man had no houses as big as cities. Nero's ceiling mechanism, as described by Suetonius, with its multiple moving parts to enable shifting celestial displays, was evidently very complex. The cosmic motion in Suetonius' description elides the elaborate ceiling on the one hand and the night sky on the other, elements which are strongly contrasted, we might observe, in Seneca's scheme. <coughs> Parallels between the passages in Suetonius and Seneca have been widely noted. Uh, Rita Dellino Centini Pierini also observes a suggestive resonance with the false ceiling of the boat through which uh, Nero plotted to kill his mother, according to Suetonius. <clears throat> in Nero's Rome, above all, a fear of collapsing ceilings might be amply justified. <laughs> the manifestation of luxury in architecture, so closely associated with Nero himself and the accounts of Suetonius and Tacitus, is treated in, the, uh, uh, in Letter 90 as emblematic of the moral failings of Seneca's contemporaries and of the existential failings, uh, the deep, sorry, existential dangers these failings entail. In his attack on luxurious building, Seneca repeatedly highlights the deliberate defiance of nature. Luxury has turned her back on nature, he said. According to Tacitus, Nero's architects, Severus and Keller, were celebrated for their ability to achieve through art what nature refused by natura denega wisset. They had the with ingenuity and audacity to attempt to create by artifice what nature had denied and to amuse themselves with an emperor's resources. While the palace no doubt took some time to complete, we may well surmise that the plans were familiar, the plans at least were familiar to Seneca. Indeed, Jacqueline Barbaceris uh, beguilingly suggests that aspects of Nero's ideology, including his building program, took their form precisely in reaction against the views of his teacher Seneca. So exactly what Seneca said was to was forbidden and the worst possible thing, that was what Nero aspired to actualize. Of course, it's also possible that Tacitus, in his characterization of Nero's project, may himself have drawn inspiration from Seneca's critique. A similar dynamic, I would argue, is perhaps also at work in letter 114, the second of my two principal examples. Letter 114 offers an extended exploration of the moral implications of faults in literary style. Starting from the question of why a corrupt literary style flourishes at certain times, something that um, uh, Roman literary theorists are quite preoccupied with, 114 alludes to some of the different faults which style may exhibit. While the maxim that a man's literary style corresponds to the way he lives is extended to apply to societies, Seneca focuses initially on the ways in which an individual's moral flaws are revealed in every detail of his bearing, dress, comportment, and writing. Seneca's prime example here is Mycenas, confidant of the Emperor Augustus. And Seneca's unremitting in his critique of Mycenas' character more generally, as well as his writing. And in this, he's quite unlike uh, others who, who write about Mycenas, <coughs> who acknowledge positive as well as negative features. For Seneca, how Mycenas lived, he writes, is too well known for present comment. We know how he walked, how effeminate he was, and how he desired, desired to display himself. Also, how unwilling he was that his vices should escape notice. What then? Does not the looseness of his speech match his ungirt attire? His eloquence was that of an intoxicated man, twisting, turning, unlimited in its slackness. There follows a succession of brief quotations from Mycenas 
phrase, which I have not inflicted on you, um, who struggle to, the scholars have struggled to make sense of. In criticising Mycenae's literary style, Seneca was not alone. Suetonius observes uh, that the Emperor Augustus despised affected writers and sometimes took them to task, particularly his friend Mycenas, whose scented curls, as he called them, he attacked relentlessly, making fun of them through parody. Along similar lines of comments from Quintilian and Tacitus' character Messala and the Dialogus. While Macrobius quotes a letter of Augustus to Mycenas, itself perhaps a parody of Mycenas' style, which Macrobius interprets as a teasing comment on his wealth and sexual behaviour, as well as his recherche prose. Mycenas is also the object of criticism elsewhere in Seneca's letters. A light motif of these attacks is Mycenas' compromised masculinity. Um, indeed, in his earlier treatise on Providence, Seneca observes that those who envy Mycenas that one who wishes to have been born Mycenas might just as well wish to have been Mycenas' wife, Terentia. Such, by implication, is Mycenas' effeminacy. <coughs> in letter 19, Seneca comments that good fortune had made him effeminate if it hadn't castrated him. Now, that seems like a very sort of extreme kind of um, imagery to use. Among Mycenas' compositions was a poem composed in the distinctive Galliambic meter entitled Sibylle. Sibylle's priests notoriously practiced self-castration to effect the transformation um, famously dramatized in Catullus Poem 63. Um, <coughs> Seneca's comment here that good fortune had castrated Mycenas is thus perhaps particularly telling. The literary politics of Nero's court were intense. We perhaps saw earlier the, the space in which um, literary activity took place, um, but the, 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 these interactions were, were clearly a source of, of um, fascination and anxiety. Seneca's hostility to Mycenae's literary style <coughs> has been diagnosed as a response to literary fashion at Nero's court where it is suggested in the latter years of his reign, Mycenae's work was in circulation and inspiring imitators. Uh, John Sullivan, for instance, traces complex rivalries played out through parody, um, suggesting, for instance, that Petronius takes Seneca's writing as his target in passages of the Satyricon. Some have detected in Seneca's demonization of Mycenae in letter 114 a covert attack on Petronius, resented because he'd recently come to exert a potent influence over Nero. Yet while Seneca is entertainingly critical in describing Mycenae's mode of life, goes around accompanied by eunuchs wrapped up in a cloak like a runaway slave, the chief concern of his attack is Mycenae's literary style. It's not obvious uh, what parallels there would be between Mycenae's style and that of Petronius. Instead, um, I, I think a, another possibility is perhaps um, a more offers um, uh, more potential. The final three paragraphs of letter 114 appear to take us in quite a new direction from the rest of the letters, and indeed, Summer's venerable edition of the letters omits them altogether. Seneca now explores the proper relationship between mind and body in terms of analogies um, with different styles of autocracy, contrasting kingship, to which corresponds the rule of the healthy mind, animus, and tyranny. Uh, the domain of an animus which is disordered. Now, as I've already said, Nero himself is never mentioned in the letters. Yet the analogy developed here, and underlining the dreadful consequences of disordered autocratic rule, recalls um, Seneca's earlier treatise on clemency, whose addressee was the young Emperor Nero. In the De Clementia, Seneca contrasts at length the rule of the Rex, as a, a good king, and the rule of the tyrant. Literary style, as we've seen, was a hot topic at the court of Nero. The emperor's own passion for literature was notorious. Tacitus, as we've seen, highlights the emperor's enthusiasm for composing poetry, um, though he suspects him of plagiarism. Suetonius, by contrast, considers the blotchy crossings out he has himself witnessed as authentic Heronian scribblings. Some fragments of Nero's poetry survive. Seneca himself elsewhere quotes and praises the line. Goliath on Persis' first satire goes so far as to suggest that um, some lines are actually from Nero's work, Attis. Um, their fierce horns they filled with mimelonian booming and batteries, poised to carry off the head torn from the proud calf, and the mean ad poised to steer the lynx 
with ivy glasses, shouts and shouts, ahoy, and reverberating echo chimes in. So maybe Nero's the author of these wonderful lines. Dio also reports that Nero delivered an Attis, or perhaps a Bacchae, at his Juvenalia festival in 59, though it's not entirely clear who the author is. Certainly it seems hardly coincidental that the examples of feeble compositions that Perseus chooses to attack are entitled Minas, um, the Bacchant, and Attis, the, the priest of Sibylle. Indeed, Attis, the self-castrated priest of Sibylle, might seem a theme redolent of the Alexandrian poetic tradition, quite in keeping with what's otherwise known of Nero's literary tastes. Um, his preferred theatrical roles included Canacy in labour with her incestuous offspring, for instance. The subject um, <coughs> of, of, of Attis, uh, gender subversion and self-castration in an exotic Trojan setting, resonates closely with themes prominent more generally in the accounts of Neronian Rome offered by Tacitus, Suetonius, and Dio. Many anecdotes about Nero's own cross-dressing, his marriage to the castrated Sporus, um, playing the part of a bride in another marriage to Doryphorus. Um, many of these stories relate to the later years of Nero's reign, but these predilections are perhaps um, foreshadowed um, earlier on. As for Nero's prose, while Seneca himself ghost wrote Nero's speeches in the earlier part of his reign, at least according to Tacitus, a lengthy inscription records a showy Neronian speech in Greek from the year 67, in which experimental Asianist features have been diagnosed. Jones argues that his Greek teachers may have been Nikites, whose florid Bacchic style and daring phraseology are noted by philosophers. The emperor seems to have relished writing in a manner which deliberately scorned his old tutor's wise advice. The suggested possibility has been raised by Rita Delian Centini Pierini that we might read Seneca's attention seeking, pleasure loving, gender subverting Mycenas, who revels in producing inventive and obscure compositions, as on some level figuring for Nero himself. The ferocity of Seneca's critique of Mycenas, which many critics have found quite surprising, thus becomes much more understandable. The coda to the letter, introducing the extended political analogy, uh, surely lends further weight to this suggestion. Nero's presence in the letters may be shadowy, but the dynamics of his pathology echo those of the tyrants of Senecan tragedy. These tyrants take particular pleasure in self-consciously embracing the extreme opposite of virtue. Indeed, the author of the pseudo Senecan Octavia evidently perceived close affinities between the anti-heroes of Seneca's own dramatic works and Nero himself, even if the Octavius Nero is rather less self-conscious in his transgressions um, than, for instance, Atreus in Seneca's Aestes. As Rolando Ferry notes, uh, Nero's entrance at line 438 at the climax of the character Seneca's tirade against the vices of um, luxury, avarice, and uh, lust figures him as the embodiment of these vices. Seneca himself, meanwhile, as we've heard, plays the role of unsuccessful advisor um, whose wise words are brusquely rejected. Echoes of the dialogue between Seneca's advice and Nero, Nero's practice resonate throughout Seneca's letters. Seneca offers florid anatomizations of moral and aesthetic defects implicitly exemplified by Nero in domains where the emperor claimed a particular distinction, architecture, poetry. Nero's occluded presence in these letters can be construed as an attempt to recuperate his spectacular excesses for Seneca's stoic project. Um, because I think these elaborate accounts of moral failings do have a role to play in Seneca's overall enterprise in the letters. Of course, Seneca's famous pupil was a catastrophic embarrassment for his teachers. <coughs> but if we go back to letter 90, we can see that, um, that while Seneca is drawn to the idealization of early human society, which characterizes so many Roman texts and also features at length in this letter, his nostalgia for primitive living is significantly tempered by his stress on the preeminent role of philosophy as something that must be deliberately striven for, that requires discipline, and without which a true life of virtue is not possible. 
Thus, as Seneca makes clear, however salubrious the simple life of virtue led in primitive times, the conditions were not conducive to the mature development of philosophy. Paradoxically, it is precisely the proliferation of vice which makes necessary the full flowering of philosophy. No longer just a matter of wise advice on how to live, of the kind the early kings may have dispensed with. To become good is an art. Only when it's challenged by human corruption can philosophy develop to acquire its mature form. Nostalgia for the so-called golden age can serve as a valuable prompt, encouraging us to emulate the material simplicity. But the knowledge and the range of choices humanity has painfully acquired in the making the transition to a more advanced existence are essential prerequisites for the practice of philosophy. So a case could be made then for seeing the elaborate and ingenious vices of Neronian Rome generally, and the emperor himself in particular, as essential material for philosophical reflection. Only in an age of flagrant vice can truly militant virtue come into its own. <coughs> so I think I'll stop there. Um, and we now have a few minutes for questions, I think. If you want to come up and then um, cluster around the microphone, if that's okay. Um, no, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have the, the microphone, so if you could. Also speak up if you have a question, um, so other people in the room can hear it, and then the microphone will record your question. Okay, um, yeah, yes. Uh, this is uh, a question concerning Pliny the Elder. I wondered if uh, there were other emperors who were being used as exemplars for in uh, Pliny's oeuvre. The answer is that there's um, Pliny and Gaius, so Pliny and Caligula, tend to get grouped together by Pliny the Elder. Sorry, Nero and Caligula get grouped together by Pliny, um, generally with hostile commentary on both. Uh, there will, though not exclusively hostile commentary in the case of Nero, uh, there will then be references to events taking place within the reign of earlier emperors like Claudius and Tiberius. But from the evidence of my notes, it's a few years back, the one who really gets the largest attention in that sense is Nero. Uh, yes. Right, I'll try to speak up this time. <laughs> um, about Mycenas, uh, may it be that um, what Seneca had in mind partly was Mycenas as a performer, um, because we know, I think, at least I've argued it, <laughs> that Mycenas's gardens contained a private stage, and of course, um, Bathyllus the great uh, virtuoso pantomimus dancer was um, uh, Mycenas's uh, freedman and also his lover. And I've argued uh, in a recent article that um, the passage in one of the Elegia uh, ad Machinatem, which refers to the uh, Hercules and Omphale legend, uh, may be an allusion to the kind of things that got up uh, that, that uh, Mycenas and his friends got up to on his private stage, and that would fit in with your um, the idea of uh, being losing one's masculinity, you know, Hercules in drag, all that sort of stuff. So uh, that might also be an, uh, a kind of um, extra dimension to that particular vitriol that, he, that Seneca has to say about about Mycenas. Thank you very much indeed. So that's, a, that's a wonderful suggestion. Uh, the, the kind of the, the Mycenas theatrical interests are really feeding in here. I mean, because they, they don't get explicitly mentioned by Seneca, but nevertheless, I think one can see that as part of a kind of uh, a, a, a whole sort of gamut of associations right, that Mycenas carries with him, um, which makes this a, a, a kind of tempting parallel for Seneca. So thank you. I shall look out for your. your um, PBSR 2016. <laughs>
Um, about Nero's uh, strange-looking neck, um, I seem to remember reading that uh, he may have had a medical condition that actually made him look like that. Uh, not goiter, but some other condition diagnosed several centuries, indeed millennia, after his death, but still possibly <laughs> valid. Um, no, you, you're, you're remembering rightly, and indeed, just yesterday I found a dissertation online um, which was all about another medical condition that you may well have been suffering from. Um, these, are, these are explanations which attempt to rationalize something that uh, we visually find strange. Um, and you know, if you're not prepared to go for the medical condition, you're prepared to go for the Mark Bradley line of fatness, um, or you're prepared to go for the stylistic line of Hellenistic. But then that's just as Hellenistic. In fact, that's more Hellenistic in some ways, as much as it is classical. So none of these things fully kind of explain. I mean, if he did have a medical condition, you've still got his image makers choosing to make that visual, and that has an impact within the alternative population of, of marble and bronze statues that there are in Rome. So for me, that doesn't help me much to think in those sorts of ways, but it's not impossible that Nero had multiple. <laughs> Maybe, more Maybe that the lure of the wine was <laughs> exerting a magical power at this point. So perhaps we could draw things to a close there. But thank you all very much for coming on this rather warm afternoon. I'm sorry, you shouldn't take the windows. Um, and before we proceed to wine, let's um, thank our speakers.